This week in the Enterprise Security News, Blackpoint Cyber introduces insurance for customers and MSPs. Qualys extends integration with Microsoft Azure Defender. Grammatech Code Sentry now identifies third-party code vulnerabilities. Attack IQ integrates with Microsoft Azure Sentinel. Aqua Security announces Kubernetes native security capabilities and funding updates from Arctic Wolf, Stackhawk, Eagle Eye Networks, and so much more. In our second segment, we welcome Jeff Capone, co-founder and CEO of Secure Circle, to discuss conditional data access for endpoints. In the final segment, Alexi Papaleonardos, oh, that's how I'm going to say it, Cloud Incident Response Manager at CrowdStrike joins us to discuss attacking and defending cloud infrastructure. Stay tuned for all that and more on this episode of Enterprise Security Weekly. This is Security Weekly. For security professionals, by security professionals. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show where we talk security vendors and aren't afraid to name names. It's Enterprise Security Weekly. Data protection is a top priority with today's work from home workforce. However, current data loss prevention tools inadequately protect data in cloud or SaaS offerings from insider threats. Secure Circle automatically protects data as it leaves SaaS services such as GitHub, AWS, and Salesforce. The protection is transparent to users and works with any application to persistently protect data, even source code. Secure your data with Secure Circle Zero Trust Data Protection. Begin your 30-day free trial by visiting securityweekly.com forward slash secure circle. Uptix has built a platform for SQL-powered security analytics. Extending the OS query agent, Uptix collects, aggregates, and analyzes a wide range of system data and makes that available to solve multiple security challenges. Their solution provides visibility across Linux, macOS, Windows, containers, and cloud workloads. Their customers are using the Uptix platform for fleet visibility, intrusion detection, investigation, and audit and compliance. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash Uptix and be one of the first to see how they've mapped over 500 behavioral rules to the MITRE ATT&CK framework. Today's networks are changing fast, and employees, devices, and infrastructures are more distributed than ever. Gigamon Threat Insight is a cloud-native, high-velocity network detection and response solution that's purpose-built to enable you to get in front of this transformation. Learn more at securityweekly.com forward slash Gigamon. Welcome to Enterprise Security Weekly, episode number 204 for October 28th. Of course, I'm your host, Paul Asadorian, joined by Mr. Matt Alderman on the lines remotely. Matt, welcome. Happy Wednesday. It's still cold in Colorado, so I have my my new my new warm quarter zippy on today. Warm quarter zippies are a good thing. Um, would you like to have all of your favorite Security Weekly content at your fingertips, learn about upcoming webcast and technical training, or just wish you could hang out with the Security Weekly crew and community? Visit securityweekly.com forward slash subscribe, where you can sign up for our mailing list, join our community Discord server, and subscribe to all of the shows on the Security Weekly network. That's securityweekly.com forward slash subscribe. Security Weekly, in partnership with the Cyber Risk Alliance, is excited to present Security Weekly Unlocked on December 10th, 2020. This is the inaugural edition of Security Weekly Unlocked and also celebrates Security Weekly's 15-year anniversary and will feature talks from Ron and Cindy Gula, Kevin Finisterre, Vivek Ramachandran, and many more. The agenda is live, as is registration, so go to securityweekly.com forward slash unlocked and register for this free event. That's right. It is free. Lots of other presenters on there, and um, we had a lot of submissions. The CFP is closed. I know some folks were asking about that recently, but uh, CFP is closed, unfortunately. And we actually really liked all of the submissions we got, which made it harder. So It made it really hard. Oh, we had such great submissions, 59 of them for 12 speaking slots, three panels. It was tough. Um, but it was a great, great submission. Uh, we're going to have a great event, Paul. Great Absolutely. Event. Yeah, there's a social engineering panel hosted by April Wright um, featuring Chris Hadnagy and many others. Um, the other panel, API Security, Mike Shima is leading that one in a diversity panel with Dr. Doug White. And um, he'll be the MC for that. So, yeah, three panels as well as lots of talks. going to be fun. Lots of stuff in the news this week, Matt. A ton. Where do you want to start? 
<laughs> well, I just went out to do all the funding stuff just to make sure yeah. we didn't miss anything this week. And I was like, holy cow. a lot cow. of funding. No, I, I, you know, I didn't see acquisitions in there. I saw just funding. There was one acquisition. Okay. Uh, Akamai made an acquisition of a mobile IoT I saw play. That. Yeah, okay. Um, that, I think that was the only one that I, I really saw in there. Uh, the two that really interest me are the McAfee IPO, because we talked about McAfee finally for the IPO right. on the Security Money Show uh, two Mondays ago, and then they went IPO later that week. And what was interesting is they ended up below their IPO target, which I thought was an interesting tell a little bit. Yeah. Um, we all know, you know, old McAfee semantic endpoint products are kind of mm-hmm. dated. Lots of new innovation in that space. McAfee goes IPO again. And they end up lower than their strike price. Um, so it's just an interesting tell to me. Mm-hmm. The second one is Telos has filed for IPO. Uh, so we should see that IPO coming soon. That's another security company coming into the IPO mix. Interesting timing. I'm not sure the markets are mm-hmm. are optimal right now before the election. Just a lot of volatility. So I, I wouldn't consider this an optimal time to go IPO. So it was a little interesting to see another uh, IPO. Um, Oh, from Telos coming. Mm-hmm. I'm not familiar with Telos. It says it delivers cybersecurity, secure mobility, and identity management solutions. Yeah, they're a company I've tracked for a while. Mm-hmm. Um, they they kind of do, I think they do a lot of different things. Um, but it's just, to, to file for an IPO, like I said, right now, it's just a little interesting timing. Interesting, um, Matt. It says... Um, and this is just coming when I just plugged their name into Google that they've got 508 employees and they were founded in 1969 in Santa Monica, California. Interesting. Cause mm-hmm. they're now in Ashburn, Virginia or something yeah. like that. They moved yeah. their headquarters. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, we'll, have to, we'll, have to dig, yeah, we'll have to dig into that. Sounds like an interesting story. Certainly having that much history behind the company. Normally companies we <laughs> are covering on this show don't go back as far as 1969. Certainly. <laughs> No, that was my birth year for all those right? track yeah, at home. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Um, uh, yeah, so uh, Stack Hawk, I, I was interested when the word stack uh, is now kind of overloaded in, I think, the, uh, I'm assuming this is application security because usually if it has stack in it, it's application security. It is. Stack Hawk is Denver, Colorado based company, so the home state. Uh, another startup in in the, in my backyard. Uh, these guys use uh, Zap, the Z attack proxy, yeah. to build a commercial DAST. Uh, is what I basically got out of this. And so they took hmm. a ten million dollar Series A round. I think it was Series A uh, to start to grow the business. And they're going to continue to provide updates into the open source Zap project, but mm-hmm. also that's the foundation of their DAST. Right. Uh, right up there with Stack Rocks and Threat Stack for the stack yes. based company. The stack. Yes. <laughs> right. Yes. You could say we're almost at a stack overflow. Ah, uh, there's my, my dad jokes working their way into Enterprise Security Weekly. In any case, uh, Arctic Wolf, that was a big announcement $200 million yes. in funding, achieving a $1.3 billion US valuation, which is impressive because, I mean, largely they're a, a services. I mean, it's based on services. There's technology, but it's around the services, right? They're a managed services provider. Yeah. I mean, it's all around uh, security operations um, and, and managed services. So, yeah, it puts them at a $1.3 billion valuation. That's huge for a service-based business. You know, you get scale out of product. You don't necessarily yeah. get scale out of services. Uh, and this is a combination of the two. That's a huge valuation. You know, we've been tracking these guys for a while. I don't remember if you've done a briefing with them or not, Paul, but I know I we've remember. talked to them in the yeah, past. We have, yeah. It's good for them. Outstanding. Uh, yeah. I, I thought the the other really interesting one here was Toma Bravo raising a record $22.8 billion. Wow. Um, people will know Toma Bravo as a private equity firm. Right. And Log- they've got logarithm. some really... Logarithm, Imperva, yeah. um, there's a couple others in that portfolio that they've taken back private or or invested in. They are building a very interesting portfolio. And $17.8 billion of that $22.8 is for its flagship buyout fund. It's the biggest ever raised by a tech-focused private equity fund. Mm-hmm. So w- what I'm seeing here is 
potentially Tomo Bravo making some more acquisitions in this space to add to their existing portfolio. And their portfolio is pretty massive. I mean, we're talking Barracuda, Blue Coat, Centrify, Digisur, and I'm just on like the C's on their on their website plucking out the security, cybersecurity companies that are in there, Flexera, if I get into the F's, right? Yep. So a lot of Yeah, them. I think so yeah, yeah I mean they're gonna go buy more companies, basically. Yeah, right? it's really what this means. Yep. Excellent. Uh what was Eagle Eye Networks? Oh, they're an AI um, artificial intelligence solution based on cloud-based video surveillance platform. Mm -hmm. uh, it's Excel. You know, Excel's done a lot in the space. Excel did the Series A at, at, at Tenable way back in the day. You know, there, there's this one's a pretty unique play, but kind of popped up on my radar. Yep. Um, I feel like Excel uh, makes some really good. good decisions in who they invest in. They have. Yeah, they have. <laughs> they got a pretty good track record. They got a pretty good track record, right? So, and this isn't necessarily cybersecurity, right? Yeah, this is kind of more physical security, I think. Right. Uh, They're is what blending this is, though, because but... Tyler sent me one. Because I was like, "What do I use for home security cameras?" And he recommended a company that was more like a security vendor, but did largely the surveillance um, software. Um, let's see. I don't remember if I find it, I'll, I'll mention it, but it's intermixed with other very technical discussions that we're having in there. Vericata. That was it. Vericata. Uh, interesting. Cause it was in the same space as what was the one we just covered? Uh, Eagle Eye. Eagle Eye right. Uh, it's enterprise security camera system. Um, which, which was kind of interesting because it seemed like an enterprise cybersecurity company, except, there were focused on in this area, the same area as, as Eagle Eye. So yep. like you can't just go buy them uh, as a consumer is what I learned. You have to like request a demo like you would for an enterprise uh, software company. So um, kind of interesting the, the technology that can be built uh, into that. I haven't looked into it uh, very deeply, but it, I think it's starting to blur the lines with cybersecurity. A little bit. I mean, physical security has always been one of those domains in the security space, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe not in the cybersecurity space, the way we think about it, but definitely in the broader security space, physical security is, is one of those domains. We haven't covered a lot of it, which is why I thought it was interesting to see mm -hmm. some investment there. A lot of us don't really think about the physical security aspect sometimes in, in our day-to-day -day operations. Sometimes they're owned by a separate executive or, or team, in right. an enterprise, they're not always. It's not always owned by the CISO in some organizations. So it's yeah, it's that, kind of an interesting. I, I think an interesting market. crossover too is you ask yourself, what happens if a laptop is stolen from our organization? Whose job is it to investigate and basically mitigate and deal with the risk and resulting incident from that? I've been in that position before. I had a break in in one of my previous companies I worked at, so it's kind of interesting. Yes. Um, anything else in the funding? No, okay. I mean that that rounds out the big yeah. news, anyways. Yeah. There's a couple other smaller ones in there, but it, sure, it, you know, yeah, um, we hit the big one. Black Point Cyber. I thought this was interesting because, well, cyber insurance. I mean, we can say what you will about cyber insurance, right? I'm not completely sold on it um, in, in all cases, certainly, but this was interesting because Black Point Cyber is offering insurance not just for well, they're offering for MSPs or MSSPs and also extending that out into their clients as well. So it's kind of like taking that model into account with cyber uh, insurance for MSPs that are managing part of, or all of, maybe in some cases, the cybersecurity infrastructure for an organization. And then I think extending that uh, insurance down to their customers, I'm not sure if they buy it separately or together or how it works, but it sounded like they would develop this model based on Blackpoint Cyber helping out other MSPs with their technology is what I gathered from the article. I think you yeah, brief with we talked to these folks before. I think so because we got this uh, announcement in advance. Yes, uh, which means that typically means we've talked to them mm -hmm. somewhere before, um, and I believe they we we have talked to them before. So we got this in advance um, of it actually hitting the street, and it was an an, an embargo. Um, what, what's interesting here is we, you, know, you can debate whether cyber insurance is a requirement or not. Mm -hmm. What I think is interesting here is how they're integrating cyber insurance into their MSP uh, to offer out as part of the program to their 
customers, I haven't really seen that approach from other MSPs yet. Mm -hmm. So it's a very interesting take on cyber insurance kind of wrapped with a managed service provider in, in providing those capabilities. Yeah. Yeah, I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, Qualys extends integration with Microsoft Azure Defender to on-premises and multi-cloud with Microsoft Azure Arc. I didn't get a chance to look into uh, the Azure Arc, but what it did say that I thought was interesting is that the Qualys built-in vulnerability assessment solution integrated in Azure Defender. So I'm not sure how that... I didn't know that there was an integration there or what that gives you or what that looks like. But it says that now supports Azure Arc, enabling customers to perform vulnerability assessment with one click on their non-Azure machines onboarded to Azure Arc. So Azure Arc is separate from Azure AD, sounds like. Yeah. I wasn't sure like how that... I, yeah. So the way I read this is Azure Arc is allowing you to connect other devices or instances or something, um, either on-prem devices and or other cloud assets. And so it's it looks like it's trying to uh, hybridize across these different environments. You've got your Azure assets and then on-prem. And it, you, even, it even says AWS and GCP in here. Yeah. Uh, uh, Azure and Arc, by integrating, uh, go ahead. Right. By integrating it there, it allows the customers, it looks like, to scan any and all of those devices that are connected to Arc. So the integration looks like it's to Azure Arc, which gives you access to Azure and non-Azure-based assets for scanning. Yeah. Helps you extend Azure management to any infrastructure and enables deployment of Azure data services anywhere is Azure Arc. I was not familiar with that. Interesting how that ties all the way back up into what Qualys is doing. Yes. Um. Attack IQ integrates security optimization platform with Azure Sentinel. We'll keep on the Azure theme for a little while because there's a couple of uh, integrations with Azure products, which have all been renamed, which is even more confusing. But Attack IQ's point of view in the market is run attack simulations, and the value they provide is you can integrate with your various detection platforms, especially SIM. And when you run the simulation, it will tell you in an automated fashion if your SIM was able to detect that attack. And if it didn't, it'll tell you how to configure that so that it does and you can rerun the simulation. That's their, that's their point of view in the breach and attack simulation market. So this integration is really just extending them out into Microsoft Azure Sentinel, which is Microsoft's basically competitor to the SIM market. Yes. I think I captured that accurately. You did, it, and it's hard to keep track because I'm working on a blog post right now around aspects of Defender and Sysmon and <laughs> you get yes. into all the pages of all the naming and stuff and all the change in names uh, on all the Microsoft products. Yep. Yeah, so uh, in the, the article definitely confer or confirms this, right? So events are detected and prevented uh, and by deployed security technologies. Confirm that the detection and prevention messages are properly forwarded to Azure Sentinel, test built-in custom queries and alert rules, exercise the actions defined in playbooks. So that is, I'm glad I, I read that because it reminded me there's an extension to that, that if, let's say you've configured Azure Sentinel, that when it detects a certain event to log it, record it, do something, and then take an action, when you run the simulation, it's going to check that that action actually took place which is pretty cool. I mean, I'm all about QA for your DevSecOps kind of stuff, right? I think that's, that's important, which is something we never really had. We've always had that for development, we would talk about QA, but I think my push is really to integrate that development style, the DevOps into IT. I think this is a great technology to help accomplish that. And on that same vein, White Source launches extension for Microsoft Azure DevOps services. So there's your trifecta, trifecta for Microsoft of Azure. Azure. So apparently Azure has DevOps services. And I'm not sure what that looks like because I, ha I haven't used it. But this integration would take your SCA platform and extend it out into your Azure DevOps environment. I'm not sure what Azure DevOps looks like, if it's good, bad, or indifferent. Depending, I don't know, if, if people have uh, opinions about it, we're all ears. Uh, I have not used it, so... Yeah, I wonder how much of this came from the GitHub acquisition and, mm -hmm. and additional capabilities uh, directly into Azure. But no, I haven't played with it either. 
yeah, Microsoft's got a lot of products out there that we have no idea how they work or what the value is because <laughs> they've, in my opinion, done kind of a poor job educating the market about it and, and us collectively as a security community. So um, I, I don't want to say whether they're bad or good. I just I think we need to know more. And that's my that's my call to Microsoft. We want to know more, and Microsoft's happy to do that. I just they're massive, mm -hmm. and it's hard to educate the market on when you have that much software to talk about, right? Correct. And, and we've we they were a sponsor for a little while, yeah, uh, to start to get that message out. I just wish they would have kept the momentum because I think it would have helped, especially with all the renaming they've done. It's oh, really hard to track yeah. what's what. Agreed. Uh, let's see. Let's go to Aqua Security unveils Kubernetes native security capabilities. I think this is really what I think is interesting, and I'm not really close to this technology, but on the surface, as I track what's happening in the market and talk to some people, StackRox was one of the first ones to make that pivot into we're Kubernetes security. And Aqua Security now, I think, is playing a little bit of catch up in that arena. I think Aqua makes some really great technology. In fact, in my training course uh, that I recorded this week that will air on Friday, I believe, uh, for Gray Hat, a virtual conference, I talked about Aqua's Trivi that we talked about on the show and provided an example. I actually took an old version of one of our PPWorks containers, Matt, and I scanned it with Trivi, and I was like, wow, that was actually really easy. I'm like, they did a really nice job with this open source software. This announcement is announcing their extension into Kubernetes. When I start to look at and evaluate Kubernetes versus some of the other options, what I've read so far, and Matt, I'd love to get your take on this, is Kubernetes offers you the most robust and ability to scale. Like it can scale much larger than Amazon's ECS and maybe some of these other platforms, although OpenShift, I probably would gather, give it a run for its money. Yes, but it's it's interesting. It gives you a lot of capabilities, but it also gives you a lot of complexity. Yes, and so the I reason about that too, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. So the reason you're seeing these solutions come into the space, Paul, is because you have such great capabilities in Kubernetes. It also introduces a lot of complexity, a lot of potential security issues. So mm -hmm. you see vendors really now focusing on aspects of securing Kubernetes. This is a very interesting shift for Aqua. Because, look, when I was at Layered Insight, we competed with Aqua on a day-to-day -day basis in the yep. container core container security space. But Aqua's expanded beyond just container security. Mm -hmm. It's container security. They're doing their scanner, which is, which is still the kind of the static side. But they also have a CSPM, a cloud security posture management component. Yep. They now have the Kubernetes security component. Mm -hmm. They're expanding into a broader application security play, not to the extent of a full SCA SAS or DAS, mm -hmm. but when it comes to the container, the orchestrator side, and even some of the cloud components, they've expanded their portfolio a lot over the past couple of years. I think there's an interesting opportunity for a vulnerability management study when it comes to containers specifically, because so many options exist today and offerings that will scan your container images for vulnerabilities. Well, who, what, what are the real differences? And mm -hmm. there's free, completely free and open source all the way through you know, to commercial products. What, what, are, what are those differences? I, I really, for my, our own personal uh, you know, self-serving, I really want to know. I really want to do an evaluation because is it, do, are we back to when we did the study of vulnerability management platforms? And we're like, okay, so well, what's the coverage? Like, how do we measure coverage, right? In that instance, there's a lot of variables that way into that equation, such as, you know, if you're checking something for a vulnerability, whether locally or remotely, there's other plugins that can discover vulnerable conditions that it's not about the number of CVEs, there's other factors. Now you're looking at a container image. I guess the same could be true for configuration versus actual vulnerabilities. Does it come down to who's got the biggest database? I'm not, I'm not sure. And I'm not sure how you measure, measure that and evaluate it properly so that when you implement this in your CICD pipeline, I know that I'm scanning all my images and I've got, it doesn't, you're never going to get to 100%, right? But I mm -hmm. guarantee you there's players that are somewhere in that like 20% range and there's others that are in that 60, 70% range. And I want to be in 60, 70%. Yeah. And, you know, two years ago, I could have given you better stats on this mm -hmm. because we were using uh, Claire, the open source yep. project, 
at Layered Insight, Insight yep. and then adding our own capabilities on top. Because open source only mm -hmm. gets you so far. That's why Agreed. I'm curious how Trivi does against some of the other open source tools, for mm -hmm. example. Then compare that to the commercial tools. So we know there's some really great commercial tools out there with SNCC and others. SNCC that have does a done great it. job, too. I mean, when we had them on and really dug into it with them, it was what struck me was those transient vulnerabilities that the dependencies of the dependencies that can really bite you. Exactly. And so that's where you, that kind of evaluation would be really interesting now between a lot of the open source projects and the, a lot of good commercial tools that are out there now. Uh, in Discord, somebody said, yeah, you know, Aqua's trying to catch up to Palo Alto. And in, in, in some respects, they're mm -hmm. right. Because if you think about the acquisitions that Palo Alto has done with Twistlock, yep. Evident IO, Redlock, et cetera, they're building out container security, CSPM, and other capabilities. Mm -hmm. Aqua has to continue to compete because, look, when you looked at the old container security top three, it was... Twistlock, Aqua, Layered Insight. The, the, we were the three fighting it out. Well, two of those three got bought. Mm -hmm. Sysdig's up there, right? Mm -hmm. So Sysdig entered the space uh, uh, kind of right as Layered Insight was leaving. So now you got Sysdig and, and Aqua is kind of the two pure plays still fighting in the space, but some of the other stuff's been integrated into bigger portfolios. And there's also the software composition analysis. So like, do you need a container vulnerability scanner and software composition analysis and, and what's the overlap there that's my other question that i i really don't know the the true answer as well because we've got a story in here Grammatech has introduced code sentry uh, that can identify blind spots in third-party code what i thought was most interesting and the thing that i struggle with with sca when you get down into the weeds of it with with all these solutions is Grammatech says it analyzes the code that will run not the build environment that's huge mm. because I want to know about vulnerabilities, whether they're in the container, whether they're in my code, whether they're in libraries, I want to know what vulnerabilities are actually accessible. What code is there? Is it running? And it's not just which library. Maybe I have one function call into that library, but the vulnerability is in a different function call. Mm -hmm. I want to get down to that level because that helps me prioritize. If there's a vulnerability in a library in my build and it's in a function that I'm calling, that's a higher priority than in a function that currently the code base is not calling. Mm. Yeah, and it, you know that's where SCAs and, and standard SCAs can run into some challenges, right, mm. in some respects. That's where I think SNCC and others that have the dependency and understand the interrelationships help, but then you also have to know your code and what's actually being called. So mm. one of the things we tried to do at Layered Insight was break down the vulnerabilities by the different libraries. Am I using curl? Am I using shadow? Am mm -hmm. I using these different functions? If I'm not, maybe I don't prioritize them. But if you can automate that, Paul, right. that's nirvana for the coders because now they're like, yeah, yeah, I'm not even calling this function. I don't care about any of this stuff. Right. Yep. Uh, let's see. What else do we have? Uh, oh, in... can I talk? Oh. Can we talk Fortinet just yes, quickly? Yes, let's talk Fortinet. Fortinet announces new secure SD-WAN appliance for large and complex WAN deployments. <sighs> Do we have to have an appliance? I, I, I didn't even know what this was saying. I don't, I don't get it. I don't. I, I mean, we get, we get, get the it. point. I, I, okay. We know that there's a lot more remote workforce. We know that we have a lot of people outside. And the way we're going to solve this is just build a bigger, batter appliance and plop it on the corporate environment that, doesn't extend have anybody added SD, anymore? Extend your I, SD I went, Yeah, I don't. I don't get it. I don't either. That's why I had to bring it up. I just, I had to point it out. I think a lot of this technology is, is certainly evolving. Um, and we should probably spend some more time digging into it. The whole yeah, I mean, SD WAN and SASE, we're doing a webcast with Perimeter right. 81. We're going to dig into it. And, and largely what I'm bringing to the table in that, in that respect is like how we used to do it, right? And I'm looking to the folks from Perimeter 81 to really describe right the solutions that's what we've been we've been talking about because i again i think this goes back to microsoft we need to educate the market and understand the capabilities and the problems that they're solving and how they're solving it so somebody in discord said the sd wan appliance is just their firewall they have some nomenclature problems around sd wan yeah, that's probably <laughs> now we now we know why we don't understand the, the that's, article <laughs> that's probably it uh, there are more articles in there. I did link to, based on last week's segment, I thought it'd be good for this audience, uh, Sysmon configurations. There's two open source projects that will help you configure Sysmon in your environment. I'm, I'm really happy with 
with Sysmon and some of the things that have been surrounding that to be able to pull logs from your endpoints, I think is a really good thing going on there. So I did link to those as well as a bunch of other stories that you can go read at your leisure. With that, we will take a short break, come back with Jeff Capone from Secure Circle. Stay tuned.